Hey there, everyone. Today on the final bar, another down day for stocks. The Nasdaq down about two and a half percent for the week. Now almost eight percent below its July peak. We'll dig into the magnificent seven and some friends. We'll look at downside objectives for some of those growth leadership names which have started to rotate lower. Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genuity will be joining us from New York. What will the Fed be doing next? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis, the technical toolkit really designed to help you appreciate what is happening around you as an investor, improve your situational awareness, recognizing what's working and what's not. And I would argue your goal as a trend follower, which is I know many of you uh, would probably describe yourself kind of threefold on any given day, right? Identify trends, follow those trends, and identify or anticipate when those trends may be reversing. I think what we've seen as you look back over the last month, right, a month ago, S&P and Nasdaq making new highs in mid-July, we've seen all these rotations to the downside, right? One by one, we've seen stocks pull back to key support levels and now more and more starting to fail to hold key support levels. You're seeing days like today with a bit of buying coming in earlier, uh, sort of in the late morning, but by the close, again, additional sellers coming in. So the influx of buyers what would, that would cause the next rotation higher, sort of the buy on the dips crowd, not really materializing and, and overwhelmed by the interest in, uh, in selling. This is causing volatility to go higher. This is causing rotation, you know, really, I guess, or, or uh, illustrating that rotation away from growth leadership into other areas of the market. We'll do our best, as always, to try to connect what we saw today into the big picture uh, of the trends and how they're evolving. Let's get to our market recap, break down some charts and what sort of signals we can find. Before we do that, by the way, I do want to start with a poll question. As always, we have polls going on our social media accounts, on our YouTube channel, of course, and we asked you, where will the 10-year yield, dollar sign TNX on our platform, where will it be one month from today? Basically above current levels, above four and a half percent, between four and four and a quarter, between three and three quarters to four percent or below 375. The most popular answer above four and a quarter. So sort of saying uh, above current levels one month from today, uh, almost uh, almost 50 percent of you. After that, between four and four and a quarter percent, 36 percent. So altogether, over 80 percent, four out of every five of us said at least over four percent. And here's the reality, right? If that is where we're thinking rates are going to be, and I would probably agree with the masses here and say above four and a quarter percent certainly makes sense. I think we go I think we go much further from here. I think five percent is is maybe part of that journey. Uh, we'll have to see how far things progress. But what would that mean for the stocks you hold in your portfolio? And as a quick cheat sheet, Higher rates don't tend to be good for growth stocks. Now, the market has kind of shied away from that uh, market maximum uh, in 2023 because you've seen rates going higher, but the mega cap growth trade working exceptionally well. Now you're starting to see it feels like all of a sudden we're waking up to the reality of what higher rates really mean, what they uh, indicate about overall economic uh, strength or weakness and how that can be a real headwind for uh, something like growth stocks. Uh, again, really appreciate answering the uh, poll question. Let's get uh, continue on with our market recap. Look what happened today. We'll talk about interest rates along with some other things uh, as well. A lot of red, as always here, I feel like recently it's, it's a bit of a broken record in terms of this deterioration. We've seen this in the last couple of weeks, but really uh, accentuated so far this week. The S&P down another 0.8%. Finishing the day below 4,400 now, down to 4,370. The Nasdaq Composite down a little bit more, about 1.2 percent. Mid caps and small caps all down uh, as well. And the small cap, excuse me, the mid cap S&P 400 down the most, about 1.3 percent lower. The VIX actually pushing up to an 18 handle, just above 18 to finish the uh, the uh, day today. And again, the VIX was down in uh, you know 12 and change not too long ago. So the volatility picture has been relatively muted. We've seen the market rally on low volatility not too long ago, right? Sort of May into June. All of a sudden, July into August, a very different feel. You're seeing leadership names rotate lower. You're seeing underperforming sectors like energy and utilities start to have decent days on a day like today. Today, and you're seeing volatility go up. And what I just described, if you ask me, describe a corrective period with a series of bullet points about what to look for, I probably would have said that thing. Maybe I would have added something about breadth, 
uh, you know, deteriorating as well, which we've uh, which we've also seen. So really is the, uh, the sort of the correction playbook is kind of playing out pretty well. And I think the real question now is not whether we're in a pullback phase. We certainly are. It's about how low and how far and what sort of time commitment we're making uh, to this drawdown and where we start to see a recovery. I think that's what we'll be probably talking about uh, for quite some time now. Interest rates continue to push higher. And as we mentioned, the 10-year yield going up, uh, you know, making a, a new high or it's certainly approaching a new high for the year. Uh, 10-year yield right around 431. Long bond yield around 441, similar to what we're seeing with the, uh, with the five-year point. So we're getting a little bit more of a steepening. We have a really good guest to talk about uh, interest rates and shifts and what that might mean for our portfolio. So I'm excited to ask Tony Dwyer a little bit about what we're seeing here with rates really starting to push to the upside and, uh, and the yield curve sort of uh, getting away from that flattening, starting to steepening up a little bit. Bond prices, of course, going lower. So bond prices and yields, as we know, are inverted. So uh, the TLT going down. Dollar index, not too, too much of a change from uh, yesterday's close. Bit of a mixed result here in the commodity space. Gold was actually slightly down. The GLD down about 0.2%. Silver prices uh, actually higher, 1.2%. Uh, oil prices moving uh, slightly higher as well. So the energy stocks actually had a pretty decent day uh, and uh, probably the only S&P sector that I would describe as having that sort of day today. Cryptocurrency is moving lower. So it's funny. I mean, at times, you know, you know, m well before well before today, we were talking uh, we've talked at times about cryptocurrencies and their relationship to stocks. Do they behave like risk assets? Do they behave more like a currency? Do they behave more like a commodity? Like what's sort of the relationship? You're certainly seeing it, in my opinion. I think the average take I would have on cryptocurrencies very much performing like a risk asset, right? It's a it's a it's a proxy for speculation. So now we're seeing sort of a risk off feel to to stocks. Investors aren't going to the relative safety or perceived safety of something like Bitcoin or Ether. It's going down even more. So Bitcoin down another three percent. Ether prices down another four percent. Most of the top 10 coins that we track on our stock charts platform in the red here going into the close. In terms of sectors, energy, again, having a pretty, uh, pretty decent update up one point two percent. All other uh, the rest of the 10 economic sectors down today. Some not by much. The materials, utilities kind of slightly lower, about 0.2%. But a couple of these really uh, getting dragged down. Consumer discretionary, the XLY was down 1.7%, followed by communication and services down 1.2%. And the consumer staples and uh, technology both down just under 1% for the trading day. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P, just sort of see where we're at. So again, two days ago on Tuesday's session, and really, and it was really last week on Friday as we got really close to the 50-day. My thoughts going into this week are, do we hold the 50-day? Do we hold this trend line from the March and May lows? If so, this is just a yet another tactical brief pullback within the context of a longer-term uptrend. We start breaking the 50-day and then have a follow through to the downside. That's where you have to start thinking about further downside uh, objectives and I think also further downside protection. How do you cushion yourself from the potential uh, downside move much further than what we've seen so far? I think we've gotten that follow through, right? And what I mean by that is the day you close below the 50-day moving average, it's really uh, tempting to start taking aggressive positions. And you certainly can. If you're, if you're trading more aggressively, I get the idea of we've broken the level, we've closed below it, that's enough. I always like to look for a follow through. And what I mean is once you've had a big break below support, or a big break above resistance, what happens next? And a lot of times what happens right after that can be really, uh, really helpful. Similar with price gaps, right? And we talked on yesterday's show, we looked at some examples of stocks that had gapped higher or lower. And what happens right after that gap can be really interesting because that tells you if additional buyers or sellers are kind of coming in and what that is doing to, uh, uh, to change the dynamics of supply and demand around a particular, uh, particular stock. A lot of the technical analysts you probably know, Larry Williams, Tom DeMarc, John Murphy, and others, all have this idea of a follow through, right? Once you have the initial move, do you confirm it with some sort of follow through? I would say no matter how you would measure that sort of thing, this week you're certainly getting that downside follow through. I don't think we're near done yet with this pullback phase. And I, if I were you, I would start thinking about downside objectives. Our general base case is looking at a move down around 4100, uh, 4180 to 4200. And that actually comprises a couple different levels, what I would call a confluence of support. 38.2% uh, retracement from the July high back down to the October 22 low. 
would be right at 4180. 4200 was an important level we talked about earlier this year. That was the February peak. It took us about three, four months to finally break above that. So it was really validated as an important uh, resistance level. And also a trend line from the October and March lows lines up right around with those same levels. The 200-day moving average, not too far below that as well. So you have a bunch of different things kind of all lining up in that same sort of place. So it tells me two things. Number one, expect, res, uh, expect support in that sort of range. That's kind of the general downside objective I would be working with. And then if and when we would break below that, that's where things can get really squirrely very quickly. So don't get me wrong. I am also looking at further downside support, areas like 3,800, 35 to 3,600, which would be a retest of the October lows. These are these shaded areas we haven't talked about or tried to think about in quite some time. May come back into play. But again, as I see more and more individual stocks rotating lower. That's where I start to get uh, a bit concerned about things. Now, we have a chart just called the chart, which is a way that we sort of, uh, you know, summarize what I what I would consider the key technical and breadth inputs at any given moment uh, and also a bit about rotation. And just from top to bottom, the S&P still going uh, up on a longer time frame. But again, that trend line from the October and March lows might be a really important one to watch. And we're not far away from that right about now, just above uh, just above uh, forty two hundred. The advanced decline line for the New York Stock Exchange briefly broke above its February high in July, but then failed, came right back down. And I think that as we look back uh, in subsequent years and think about what 2023 was like, I would say signals like this as the S&P and the Nasdaq making a new high, but the advanced decline line is really not confirming that could be one of those really interesting takeaways showing you that the rotation was uh, sort of uh, impending. Now, other breadth indicators have really deteriorated as well. We're down to around 34 percent of the S&P above their 50-day moving average. That's down from 90% about three weeks ago. So in the last three weeks, about half of the S&P, uh, actually a little bit more, about uh, 55% of the S&P were above their 50-day and now have broken their 50-day moving average. We've seen a couple of uh, the magnificent seven stocks, the FANG stocks, uh, doing so just uh, this week. The bullish percent index, of course, we highlighted uh, a couple weeks ago as we were nearing that 70 level. That's really confirmed that the point and figure charts have rotated more in a bearish positioning. And we're just starting to see defense outperforming offense. The problem with this ratio and why it's not just going straight down is the denominator is consumer staples. And if you want to find an area, a group of stocks that have not done particularly well recently, consumer staples are, are probably the, the ones I would uh, bring up. You think about food products names like Hershey's and others have really been struggling. So even though consumer discretionary started to rotate lower, Staples actually not doing particularly well uh, either. So you're not really seeing a broad rotation into pure defensive plays like Staples. I would argue it's more in other areas of the market like energy. Things we're seeing actually pop higher uh, on, a, uh, on a day like today. I also want to highlight uh, high yield spreads. This is one of the charts that I like to look at, thinking about high yield spreads, volatility in the S&P, kind of three different things, but all very helpful, I would argue, at recognizing sort of a risk on versus risk off environment. High yield spreads have actually remained uh, fairly narrow. Uh, and again, this is plotted inversely because I'm really focused on the S&P at the bottom and I want to know whether or not the conditions are more bullish or bearish for stocks. So I have high yield spreads plotted upside down. So the more that this line would go down, the wider spreads are getting, which is more of a risk off sort of uh, feel. And also uh, the VIX, if it rotates lower on this chart, that's actually the value of the VIX getting higher. That's volatility increasing, which is more, again, more of a period of uncertainty, more of a fearful uh, group of investors, and the volatility is increasing. So, again, those things would line up with stocks rotating lower. You're certainly seeing the VIX uh, rotate lower. It's down at 12 and change there in late June. We're now down in the 17 uh, plus range. Uh, high yield spreads not quite rotating uh, down just yet. But again, there's usually a bit of a lag on this rating. I might be very interested to see if you see by the end of this week, spreads kind of widening out uh, a little bit further than what we've seen so far. You know, we talked about the Magnificent Seven. I don't know if I'm 100 percent married to that way of describing it, because I feel like I, I'm getting at least eight stocks that I want to follow. So I'm calling this Magnificent Seven and Friends for now. I'll keep working on a better acronym, but I'll take it for now. So, you know, I, I thought it might be helpful to just look in particular at some of these growth names and think from a technical perspective how the picture has changed. So when I when we talked back here in April and in May and in June and July, we got questions about Apple's going up, you know, when do we need to start selling? And I would say there's 
to there are two general ways you can approach something like this, right? A chart that's working really well and it just keeps going higher. And market history is full of these kind of names, to be honest. It's not unusual. It's not a 2023 only type of, uh, of environment. Lots of stocks get in up trends and go. There's times when Starbucks and Crocs and other, you know, growth names like Alphabet and others have had these extended runs. They happen. The question is, what do you do? So I would say, from a technical perspective, you have two choices, right? Either try to be early, uh, and what I mean is buy, bet on some contrarian reversal. You know, sell when things look really, really good. The problem with that is if you're too early, you sell out and you miss out on some really good gains. And that is a very real issue. Many of us, if not all of us, have experienced at some point. So I tend to shy away from that because there is nothing worse than selling after a 20% gain and leaving a 200% gain on the table. So I tend to stick with things until the chart tells me that it's no longer working. And that's where I think We've seen it. So you're giving up that initial drop when something like Apple gaps below its 50 day. But remember, I was taught all large losses begin as small losses. So if you can recognize when a, when a working trade starts to not work and unwind things early enough, then you'll, you'll, you'll stay away from those really disastrous declines and, and not hold things way too long as something goes down 10, 20, 30, 50, 80 percent, right? So I, I would argue with, with charts like Apple, chart number two, Microsoft, the fact that these broke below the 50-day moving average, that came after some clear bearish divergences. That's sort of the early warning signal. But for me, getting below the 50-day uh, moving average, pretty damning evidence. Now the 50-day moving average is sloping downwards in both cases. So I think a pretty clear argument to be leaning away from these uh, uh, technology leadership names uh, if, you've, if you're not there already. I, I'm certainly not seeing signs of that changing uh, at the moment. Now, those aren't the only sort of uh, key growth stocks that have broken down through their 50-day. Here's Tesla. Uh, again, and, and again, what, what's very common with about half of these is the bearish momentum divergence June and July, higher highs in price, lower peaks in momentum. And that usually means or usually implies we're not in the second or third inning of a big run. We're in the eighth or ninth inning. Now, if you're a Mariners fan, most of our games recently have been extra innings. So maybe that's a bad analogy to be using here in Seattle. But overall, you probably get it if you know baseball. We're in the later stages of the game. We're probably getting to the end of the bear market or bull market phase. And then for me, it's what signal tells you to start to rotate. Look at what's happened with Tesla. We've broken the 50-day moving average. We've made a new swing low. We're starting to really, uh, you know, the momentum picture is getting worse and worse. The relative strength is deteriorating. These are all conditions that happen when a stock has been working and is no longer working. Other thing to remember with some of these names is looking at just simple trend line analysis. If you take a trend line from the January low and the April low, you'll see we actually broke down through that trend line this week as well. So one of those things that I just mentioned hopefully would trigger for you and tell you that things are uh, getting worse. Now, just to finish off our, uh, our recap here, Meta just going below its 50-day uh, moving average today, down another 3%, really, I think, following the lead that we saw with those other growth names. Netflix as well this week, getting below its 50-day. Uh, its that leaves a small number of names that are actually managing to hold their 50-day moving average. And I think the only ones I would really probably highlight and feel comfortable doing so, Amazon and Alphabet. These are the two, I mean, if you had to pick which of these stocks still looks bullish in, in a loose definition, those would be the two. I would have a laser focus on the 50-day moving average on charts like Amazon, clear support around 125, 126. I would not be surprised if those levels fail as everything starts to feel the weight of the uh, mega cap growth stocks that initially sold off names like Apple and Microsoft. We need to uh, bring on our guest here in a moment, Tony Dwyer. Before we do so, I want to make a couple quick announcements. First off, we welcome your questions. We're actually going to do an all mailbag episode tomorrow. We did our webcast, uh, or excuse me, our live Q&A uh, earlier this week. We had so many great questions. We wanted to feature some of them in a standalone show. So tomorrow we'll be featuring those uh, for the final bar. Keep the questions coming, by the way. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email on uh, X. Just tag us at final bar SCTV. And on YouTube, just drop a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts TV YouTube channel. Also to let you know, I have a webinar coming up next week on Tuesday, August 22nd called The Great Rotation of 2023. There's no denying if you've been following these markets, hopefully you've been a steady watcher and, uh, and viewer of uh, Stock Charts TV and our show, The Final Bar. If you have, you've recognized this rotation we've been highlighting. A number of our guests have been, you know, sort of discussing and debating the dynamics of this shift. Really want to take a step back in this webinar, focus on the technical evidence, looking at seasonality, looking at price trends and reversals and inflection points, and also measures of market breadth and sector rotation. You can sign up for that free event 
at marketmisbehavior.com slash rotation. That's coming up next Tuesday, the 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern. Final announcements. The final bar is going back live. We've had a nice little break here, sort of, uh, you know, working up some technology in the Stock Charts TV studio. We are ready to go. Tests have been completed with a big thumbs up. So we're going back live on Monday's show. Uh, we'll be doing it right over the YouTube platform. So if you've been watching our show on YouTube, no change. You'll see it just as you uh, always did. But you'll probably see it posted a little bit earlier because we'll be running the show live at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, right after the close to bring you our uh, insights and updates as soon as possible, right after the bell is rung in New York. I want to bring on today's guest, Tony Dwyer. Tony has been a frequent guest on the show. It's always a pleasure to have him on. He's the chief market strategist at Canaccord Genuity in New York, also a very accomplished private pilot. And one of the first questions, Tony, I always ask you is, have you been flying recently? And as always, you didn't disappoint. You shared with me some some great uh, stories recently. And I'm always drawn to the relationship between what you're trying to do with a plane and what we're trying to do in the markets. Are we in a uh, are we in a stall of sorts or have we have we pushed the yoke forward and we're nose down here? How would you describe the markets <laughs> today with aviation terms? So last week, uh, thank you for having me, Dave. Yeah. Um, last week we had um we wrote in our note, there's two kinds of, of aviation. There's visual flight rules where you have to remain clear of any clouds. You have to be able to see perfectly. That's a bull market, right? Or even a bear market that's consistently going down. And then there's instrument flight rules. And that's when you can fly in the clouds and you go by your instruments only. And there's times when you use your instruments where it feels like they're not working. Mm. And that's literally what it felt like a, a month ago. Right. It, it, it just all my macro indicators on money hit, are showing that we should be near a recession. But all the, the market just kept going up every day. And the, and the issue that I have today, so I, I'll give you an example. It's a strange environment. Your credit spread chart when you were talking about high yield debt spreads. Yeah. I think what's important that that many are missing here is that it's not the spreads that are the key. It's the absolute level for this reason. The, the compression in the spreads is happening because interest rates are going up on the 10 year. So when I look back over, this is a really important point for me. When I look back over the last year, Dave, more less level in the, of the cycle. Yeah. Corporate rates are bumping up against the highest level of the cycle, whether it's investment grade or high yield debt. U.S. Treasury yields are making new highs for the cycle. So what typically off lending scenario, economic scenario, what generates that next leg of growth, it's not magic. I mean, unless you're my kids and go pick the money off the tree, <laughs> it's not magic. You have to provide an increase in the in the outlook for money. And that has always come from a reduction in those rates because it's mm. stimulative. It makes people want to borrow, whether it's a mortgage, a corporate bond, or a US Treasury. Yeah, rising rates kind of have impacts all over the place. And I feel like now we're starting to, I, consumers certainly starting to feel the real impact of that. If you try to buy a house right now, you're certainly certainly getting that, that experience firsthand. You have some charts that you shared with us, really thinking a little bit about the Fed, the rate cycle. And of course, now we're dealing with the 10-year just pushing higher this week, uh, continuing this trend. Can you talk us through these charts and what we should be thinking about the Fed's position here? So the it Dave, as you know, the Fed is raising rates pretty aggressively. I think what most people don't realize is the fastest rate hike cycle in history. The red line is where the current the Fed currently is, whether they go sideways or up one more time. It, it's still the fastest rate hike cycle in history. The one below it, the only other one that was more significant and lasted actually longer was, guess when? Paul Volcker. Mm. Now, isn't that interesting, given that Jerome Powell in every press conference says that he doesn't want to mistake, make the mistake of the early 70s by easing too quickly. He's made the case that he's going to be Paul Volcker and keeping rates like this higher for longer is a really important point. I'll give you an example. How many people bought, used credit? They went in and they bought a new bed and the salesperson said, hey, you can buy it without a payment or interest rate expense for the first year. You're like, yeah, great. The problem is now the interest rate is 5% and not a half a percent. And that's really why the Fed, the, what deteriorated, I think people would like to attribute it to economic activity, but I really think the rise in the yields started when Janet Yellen announced that they're going to raise a trillion dollars in U.S. government treasuries in this in this quarter. It was 30% more, a third more than the market was looking for because 
Remember, the Fed finances the deficit, which I believe is the next slide. The Fed finances the deficit on short term interest rates. So a year ago, they're financing it at a half a percent or one percent. Today, they're doing it at five and a half percent. So you've got to issue more treasuries to pay for the interest expense on the treasuries you're issuing. And the chart you have in front of you, the very top line is the um, Federal Reserve balance sheet. Yep. It shows the the entire amount. Now, what you saw in Silicon Valley, you saw a blip. The day before Silicon Valley Bank, I don't think a Fed person would have told you that they're going to expand the balance sheet. We're quantitative tightening, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. In a nanosecond, they expanded the balance sheet. That's what <laughs> happens when you go into any perceived crisis, whether it's Japan, Eurozone, UK or here. So. But now we're seeing a drop. And the reason that's important is the biggest buyer for mortgage spread, mortgage debt or government debt was the Fed. If you go to the next slide, the reason that is so why quantitative tightening on top of the Fed rate hikes is so important. Now, this is a chart provided to me from Ivy Zellman. I call her the, the queen of home building. She's an outstanding housing analyst. The reason that what this chart shows you is that line is the spread between the 10 year treasury yield and the mortgage rate. Okay. It is at a historic high. That spread is supposed to be about 175 basis points. In other words, a 7% mortgage is that way because you don't have anybody buying the mortgages. So that extra supply without the demand is creating a wider spread. So the good news is when you look out someday when the Fed starts to cut rates, and this, if the Fed cut rates 100 basis points and the 10 year came down 100 basis points and this went back to normal, you'd have a 2% lower mortgage expense. Right. right. So that ultimately is going to be the bull story is when the Fed gets back in the game. And, and Dave, that's a question that I get. The first question everybody asks me because they're used to me being bullish and I haven't been for 18 months. What's going to get me to change is when all of these interest rates come down. We are in a levered system. The chart you have in front of you is at the left arrow that's pointing to that low point. Yeah. That was a generationally unlevered system in debt to GDP. Okay. We're in a generationally levered system now with the highest interest rates in the generation. So not only do you have the highest interest expense, you have the highest amount that you're funding. Mm. And therein lies the issue is the in a levered system, you can't inflate your way out of it because it costs too much. And the, and so the only answer here is eventually you end up in a recession that's nasty enough that unemployment moves up quickly. The Fed gets really aggressive. They stop quantitative tightening. And all of a sudden you get interest rates to go down. I think that truly is the key. Um, and, and the 10 year right there is exactly like if you if you had an HYG chart, Mm -hmm. or, or not an HYG chart, a yield chart for yep. high yield debt, it would show you eight and a half percent. If you're talking to a CFO of a company, they don't care if, if the spread's narrow. They care mm -hmm. that a year and a half ago, they were doing three and three quarter percent. Yeah. And now they're doing eight and a half percent. <laughs> the spread's not relevant. It's a great, you know, people like me love to do that, you know, while you're with the academics, right? Do you care if your mortgage spreads? Are narrow, or do you care that the mortgage is at seven percent, the highest in a generation? Yeah, right. So, we, so fair point, right? So, our poll question was asking about the tenure, just what what may come next. I'd love to know how you would answer that question. It was, you know, where would you see the tenure one month from today? Now, that could still be the middle of this sort of pullback, can you know, sort of choppy period. But what do you see next? Is this just the beginning of the tenure rate going higher? And what does that mean for a, a portfolio right about now? Uh, Dave, you've forgotten more than I'll ever know about technical analysis, but this is an interesting one because if you take the spread of that 10 year, um, this trading range it's been in, it's yep. about, I don't know, 60, 75 basis points. Yep. So on the breakout, you would add the, the, the spread of that trading range. So it'd be in the upper fours. Yep. But here's the issue. Okay. If you look back at April 10th, April 9th, mm -hmm. you broke down. And you would have thought that you take the spread of the, the trading range before it, it should have gone down into the twos. Yeah, yeah. So there's times in the in the macro world where the charts are, it makes me a little nervous to just go by tactical. If the market stays under pressure and the futures deteriorated after the close, this is not, 
it's a tough situation. You, you've got a lot of fear in there. It should have kind of already bounced. But to your point, only t- at my reading today, it's only 10% of stocks are above the 10 day. Yeah. That's pretty washed out. Yeah. Um, but I, so the, to answer very long winded, that teach you for asking me a question. <laughs> long winded answer is we're, we're in the clouds. I'm going to trust my instruments. My instruments are the market's going to stay under pressure. And if that's true, I think interest rates come down. So, so in a month, I think they could be lower. So with that in mind, then, what, how would you play this, uh, this current environment if you're looking out, you know, one to three months in terms of positioning, yeah. right? You have major benchmarks breaking down. It's certainly not a feel that we're hitting any sort of bottom here. We just kind of continue to go lower. Do you look at growth names like Microsoft and Apple that have already retraced quite a bit as a new opportunity to layer in? Or do you go to areas like energy that are actually starting to show some gains here recently? Where, where, do, you, where do you hide or where do you focus your, your capital in this sort of environment? So, David, our call has been to be, quote unquote, light and tight, have extra cash and be pretty tight to the benchmark and not make a major call. Last summer, we made a major call to be defensive and, and honestly took a lot of heat for it. And then you went into that October swoon. I think you could have a similar kind of thing, but but... The difference is there's three stages of this thing from a macro level. First, good news is bad news because it means a tighter Fed. Then you go into bad news is good news because it means the Fed could stop raising rates. But ultimately, you get bad news is bad news, and that's your buying opportunity. So we're light in exposure without a major sector bet. We've been that way. You, you've been a friend and client for years. I am annoyingly consistent, (laughs) like annoying, you know, stressing the word annoying. Um, and, you know, I don't change a lot. So if the only yeah. thing that will really get me sustainably bullish is a drop in rates, that means once you do get the pullback in the market, you want to go the early cycle theme because that's what you're really playing for when you get that drop in rates. Mm. This is really helpful, Tony, as always. We'll keep watching the 10 years, see how things play out. Listen, really appreciate you coming on, on as always. Fly safe, keep the blue side up, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. <laughs> for sure. Thanks, Dave. That's Tony Dwyer. Tony's the chief market strategist at Canaccord Genuity. Also uh, runs a firm called Dwyer Strategy. Just really thoughtful. I, again, I, I, one of the things I very much miss about being at a large money manager is having people like Tony willing to come in and chat about markets and be able to ask someone like him questions. Just a, an, an incredible encyclopedia of market dynamics and macro strategy. One of the best at helping to navigate a very macro driven market as in 2023. Always a a good take from uh, Tony Dwyer. We've got to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes to tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. We have to go with breadth. I keep highlighting different breadth indicators just to show this rotation that we've seen. Again, there's no denying that the market is in a pullback phase. And we've seen that from some of the early warnings, some of the divergences that we mentioned, uh, you know, in months past. We've now seen some of those early rotations happen with some of the growth leadership uh, pulling back while others remain strong. Now we're seeing kind of everything uh, rotate in there. And breadth conditions had been actually pretty meager. If you look back here in May, which, again, the market was actually doing okay getting ready to make a new uh, new high for the year. It was still a 50-50 shot if you brought up a stock, whether or not it was above its 50-day moving average. It was still pretty narrow leadership. That changed in June and July as more and more stocks started to rotate higher. Turns out, I think that was sort of the sign or one of those signs of the end of that uptrend phase. And you see when breadth conditions get extreme, like 90% of stocks in the S&P above their uh, 50-day moving average, 75% above their 200-day. Now we've rotated lower. As of this week now, and as of uh, today's uh, close, we have less than 50%, down to around 35% of the S&P uh, still above their 50-day moving average. So most stocks actually have broken down through their 50-day, and we're almost to the 50% level uh, above their 200-day moving average. For me, that is my basic back of the envelope. Is the market breadth conditions? Are the market breadth conditions bullish or bearish? What percent of stocks above their 200-day? That's a good starting point for me. When we get below 50%, that just tells me the potential to go much further is very real. This is not just a what could happen. It's about what actually is happening as you see stocks failing to hold a key level of perceived support. Chart number two, the 10-year yield. That was awesome. I wish I could have asked Tony Dwyer about 100 questions there, uh, just talking about how to think about spreads. That was actually really, really helpful. Thinking about the absolute level in rates, the potential for things to to go higher. He was actually saying uh, he saw the tenure actually lower a month from now. Again, that's all about what happens over the next uh, couple of weeks. Right? Obviously, a lot of a lot of game left to be played. 
From a technical perspective, I'm noting uh, the 10 year yield sort of testing a new high, closing above 4.3% today. Uh, we didn't even close above there back in October of last year, which was the high water mark we're now, uh, we're now facing. So, from a technical perspective, trend in rates is up, trend in bond prices is down until proven otherwise, in my opinion. Finally, we talked about the uh, magnificent seven and friends. I would put an eighth one in there. I probably put Netflix. I think a lot of people don't include that in there. I think it's still an important one when you're thinking about streaming and uh, all of those sorts of, uh, of issues. When you look at the FANG index, clear rotation to the downside. When you look at the relative strength of the FANG stocks using the uh, NYSE FANG plus index also breaking down. But what's most concerning to me are the individual stocks that are failing to hold their 50-day moving average. Only a couple still holding above their 50-day. And those might be interesting ones to watch. Alphabet actually holding up uh, the best. Amazon pulling back a bit after gapping higher uh, in August. I'd, I'd say Alphabet's probably the still strongest of the, uh, of the group. But overall, a lot of rotation down. But the problem is, or I guess the reality is, there's a lot of room below those, uh, those charts, even after they've started to sell off. So don't expect a bottom to occur just because we've come down off of the highs. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. We're going to do an all mailbag show tomorrow. Then we will be live with this show starting next Monday. So tune in live on our YouTube channel. We'll have the replay, uh, of course, as always, as we've always done, uh, posted as soon as uh, we can. Have a great one. And for Stock Charts and Redmond Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.